Thank you, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation on voters and elections in Wisconsin. I would first like to thank the Wisconsin Historical Society and their speakers bureau for furnishing our speaker today. Today we have Jonathan Cathart. He is the author of numerous books on Wisconsin and Wisconsin's history. Um, he's earned his PhD in U.S. history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he's a specialist in Wisconsin and Midwestern history. Um, he's worked as a researcher and an editor for the Wisconsin Historical Society, the Max Cade Institute, and the Wisconsin State Capitol Historic Structure Report Project. He is currently a professor of history at UW Milwaukee at Waukesha, where he has taught since 2004. So everyone, welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Oh, it's fun to be here. This is the point I would I would say welcome to the to the library, but I can say that anyway because welcome to my library in Waukesha. Um, you may hear a dog howling briefly, uh, so pay that no mind. It's not the wolves out to get me. It's just nutmeg looking for some attention. So what I want to talk about tonight um, is the recent um, Wisconsin electoral history. And there we are. So voters and elections in Wisconsin, sort of putting uh, recent events into historical context and looking at some of the big trends and, and issues in Wisconsin's past. Wisconsin has one of the most interesting political histories, I think, of any state. There is so much character, so many interesting ideas and interesting trends. So it has been a, a really rewarding field to study, and I'm, I'm really happy to be able to be sharing some of it with you uh, here tonight. So to start with, I think maybe I just want to talk briefly about, you know, what we do as, as historians in studying elections. And the central question I think we always keep coming back to is, is why people vote the way they do. What's intriguing about this question is that the way I think the, the founders of the country anticipated and the way we would like to think that it works is that this is a fundamentally rational choice that presented with a slate of candidates, voters select the most qualified candidate, the one that they have the most confidence in is going to do a good job. But as we have seen, and as uh, political scientists have shown recently, people tend not to be motivated in politics by rational thought. We tend to be voting very emotionally. And for many of these races, that's an important factor because for lots of races, uh, candidates are basically equally qualified or qualified enough for an office. So when you're faced with essentially uh, two choices, both of which would be doing the job perfectly well, emotion or other uh, preferences come into play. Sometimes those election results are so surprising and shocking and seem so out of the norm that they need further explanation. Those are the ones that are really fun to look at because they demonstrate what is unnatural. Sort of, it's a way of looking at what the normal political behavior of a community is by looking at the time where that isn't the case. It's the exception rather than the rule. So what I look for when, when I'm studying elections, and, and I've looked at a lot of, of, of elections in Wisconsin history, we first of all look for big patterns. That is periods where one political party seems to really dominate and control the narrative and win frequent elections. Um, I also look for geographical consistency where one particular part of the state tends to be very loyal to one party. We see this today certainly with uh, Madison and Milwaukee being you know, bastions of democratic strength um, and the Milwaukee suburbs like Waukesha, Washington, and Ozaukee County, the, the Wow counties being very strongly Republican. So those sorts of, of consistent patterns are important. But as historians, we also look for change. And so over a long period of time, sometimes voting behavior drifts, if you will, uh, moving from a, a, a time or a place where one party is particularly dominant to one where they're more evenly matched, and sometimes there's a switch. The exceptions, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> excuse me, are when we see an election that is uh, startling. 
and something that defies the pattern. And it suggests to, to historians, something changed. There was something new that entered the equation that altered the usual typical result. And uh, we have to figure out what that is. It's very much, if you will, sort of the similar way to which um, scientists conduct experiments, right? They, they have uh, a, a control that is the normal and they introduce new elements to see if it changes. It's kind of the same matter. We, we have an election that is unusual. We have to figure out what is the new element, what changed that uh, changes the result. So to demonstrate that tonight, um, I'm gonna look at one very profound pattern. If you study anything about Wisconsin political history, it is clear that the Republican Party for a long time was the dominant party. That may make it sound like Wisconsin politics is really boring and that it's just one party running everything, but there are some exceptions. And the two that I wanna look at are a handful of democratic surprises that when you look closely at them, they reveal something very central to uh, Wisconsin voting behavior, why people vote the way they do. And then the other big exception, of course, is the Progressive Party. Wisconsin has a long tradition of progressive politics. Uh, Robert La Follette is, is you know, the, the titan in Wisconsin electoral history. And that is sort of an exception to it. It, it shapes the way the 20th century begins. Uh, it has echoes still today. So I'm going to start with a pattern and look at the, the, the main thing, the way that the Wisconsin elections usually go, and then look at these couple of exceptions. Uh, the numbers are pretty compelling. I'm, if we look at the, the, the years, the century between 1856 and 1957, so about 100 years when the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are the two parties in Wisconsin, Republicans win the governor's office most of the time. 86% of elections are won by the Republican candidate. It's a lot of elections too, because uh, the governor's term was two years until 1970 when, when four year term became the norm. So there's a governor's election every two years, 86% of the time the Republicans win. Similarly, in the um, congressional races, if we look at the total number of congressional seats over that period of time, it's 458 separate congressional races 342 times out of 458, the Republicans win, so 75% of the time. In the legislature, again, for most of this time, the Republicans have solid majorities in both houses, the Assembly and the Senate, which means that with a Republican governor, Republicans in the legislature, it's very much a Republican show. Additionally, up until 1916, U.S. senators were not elected in a, a direct election as they are now. They were elected by the legislature. So a Republican legislature, if they have majorities in both houses, they're going to elect a Republican senator. So if we look at the two Wisconsin Senate seats, In 81 out of 106 years for one seat and 85 out of 108, that's when the Republicans control the US senators or 78%. Now the one of these figures that's a little bit different, <coughs> excuse me, is that the uh, vote for president of the 28 presidential elections between those years, the Republican nominee gets Wisconsin's vote 19 times. It's a little bit lower and I think the reason for that is simply the phenomenal popularity of Franklin Roosevelt in Wisconsin. He carries Wisconsin in 32, 36, and 40, um, really by large margins. So those kind of skew the presidential vote a little bit more towards the Democratic side. We could also, I think, add in uh, Woodrow Wilson's election in 1912 that was essentially a four-way presidential race, and Wilson won uh, Wisconsin, but uh, not by uh, a majority. He only had a plurality of the votes. So if we, if we take 
those into consideration that puts the presidential election much more in line with the other. But the big picture is pretty clear. The Republicans dominate for a century. Now, of course, the reason is why. And there are several, I think, uh, explanations for why the Republicans do so well. And the first is their appeal towards patriotism. In the years after the Civil War, Republicans frequently campaigned uh, in a style that was known as waving the bloody shirt. It was reminding voters that the Democrats were the party of rebellion. The Democrats were the party of Southerners. They were the party of slaveholders. So if you think about how important the Midwest as a whole, and Wisconsin particularly, was in fighting the Civil War and winning the war for the Union, this is a very powerful emotional appeal. You can't vote for the Democrats because if you vote for a Democratic candidate, you are essentially uh, voting against the party that freed the slaves, saved the Union. Um, you probably knew someone who was a veteran and had fought in the war and, and you're really mocking them if you vote Democratic. So it's, it's an emotional appeal. The Republican Party takes strong advantage of that. And um, one of the principal veterans organizations in the 19th century is called the Grand Army of the Republic. The Grand Army of the Republic was uh, essentially a, a union veterans organization, but it becomes really closely associated with the Republican Party. And Grand Army of the Republic gatherings and celebrations and parades very closely correlate with Republican votes. And in fact, Wisconsin candidates were very eager to take advantage of this association. Seven of nine governors in these post-Civil War years were veterans, three of whom were actually generals. So in order to, to play up this idea of uh, the party of Lincoln, the party that saved the Union, the party that ended slavery, it's a powerful association. Uh, we see this very clearly in these, uh, these governors. Uh, we've got left to right Lucius Fairchild, Jeremiah Rusk, and Cadwallader Washburn. This Lucius Fairchild portrait is um, uh, a very impressive portrait. It's painted by John Singer Sargent, uh, a very famous American artist. And he captured um, not only a wonderful expression in Fairchild's face, but you'll notice that Fairchild is missing an arm. Fairchild always wore the, the left arm of his coat very ostentatiously pinned up to his breast so that people could see that he had been wounded. He lost an arm at Gettysburg, uh, that he had, had uh, suffered for the war. It got him a lot of votes. He was a very, very popular figure. Jeremiah Rusk was also an officer. Uh, Uncle Jerry was elected three times. Lucius Fairchild served three terms. Jeremiah Rusk served three times. Cadwallader Washburn was a uh, flour milling uh, magnet from La Crosse. The Washburn Mills uh, eventually becomes part of uh, General Mills uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, but he ran not as a businessman, he ran as a Civil War hero. So that first part of the Republican dominance, I think, really comes down to this appeal to uh, post-Civil War sentiment. The second element of Republican dominance is a little bit more complicated. This is referred to as the ethnocultural interpretation. What we have seen and observed is that, generally speaking, in Wisconsin, if we had to, to make a broad generalization, Protestants, more often than not, by, by a significant margin, voted Republicans. Catholics mostly voted Democrats. The reason for this is in the, the political history of these two parties. The Republican Party, uh, as, you, as you may know, was a new party in, in the 1850s. It was organized um, in Wisconsin at Ripon uh, first, and then subsequently in other Midwestern states too. Um, its principal position was opposition to the expansion of slavery, preventing slavery from entering the Western territory. But the Republican Party builds on earlier political parties, particularly the Whig Party. The Whig 
party had been a, a party uh, formed in the 1830s. It was very pro-economic development. It was pro-banking. It was pro-business. That's one part of the new Republican Party, the, the former Whigs. The other part of those, um, uh, the new Republican Party, were reformers, mostly reformers from kind of a New England, New York background. They were very optimistic about society. They believed that society could be improved, so they promoted education. Uh, they are opposed to slavery. Many of them are in favor of giving women, giving women the right to vote. But the biggest and most popular reform element of this group was temperance. That is, they said that Americans drank too much. Uh, Americans did drink too much. The amount of alcohol consumed in the early 1800s is absolutely astonishing. We are lightweights by comparison. So they are urging people to, to voluntarily give up um, alcohol, and they actually become uh, prohibitionists in the sense that they are willing to enact state laws uh, and lobby state legislatures to pass laws outlawing the sale and manufacture of uh, intoxicating beverages. Wisconsin very nearly, this is absolutely a shock, but in the 1850s, Wisconsin passed a liquor bill that actually outlawed the uh, transportation, sale, and manufacture of liquor. It was vetoed by the governor, uh, Governor Barstow. Um, the Whigs favored a very activist sort of government to promote reform, to encourage good behavior, compulsory education, um, uh, stricter liquor control. There is also a strong nativist element. That is, a lot of the, the Republicans came from that uh, part of the Whig party that disliked immigrants, were suspicious of immigrants, and particularly Catholic immigrants. So all of that is part of the new Republican party. The leaders of the Republican party try very, very hard to, um, to downplay that element of its past, that, that nativist anti-immigrant uh, part of it, but it pops up periodically. The Democratic Party in uh, the 19th century was much more in favor of small government. It was essentially more libertarian uh, than we think of as the modern Democratic Party being. The Democrats opposed liquor laws, they opposed mandatory education, they really favored small government, low taxes, uh, very much opposed to um, uh, banks. They tended to be hard money Democrats, that is they favored actual circulating money that was gold and silver. So they were very different than the modern Democratic Party. <coughs> so when you look at it this way, it kind of makes a lot more sense. Protestants would be more drawn to that because the Protestant groups in Wisconsin were um, uh, Scandinavians, there were a lot of Germans. They, they tended to be more in favor of activist government. The Scandinavians certainly were in favor of liquor control laws. It's much more amenable to their political culture. Catholics, on the other hand, were Irish and German and didn't like being told that they can't go to the beer garden after church on Sunday or were threatening to, to close down their um, uh, their taverns, and they certainly didn't like the anti-Catholicism that still occasionally popped up in, in Republican rhetoric. So they, they, they tend to be very closely associated with these parties. Now the German element is particularly interesting because if you know anything about uh, German history or, or Germans in Wisconsin, they're not monolithic. There are German Catholics and there are German Protestants, uh, Lutherans mostly. Uh, in addition, there's a large minority of German freethinkers, intellectual reformers. So Germans were kind of a swing vote. Uh, they could mostly vote according to religious lines, but they could be swayed one way or the other. The third element, I think, helping uh, Republican dominance is the presence of third parties. It, it, fundamentally, it was a two-party system, but by the 1880s, the Republicans and the Democrats are more evenly matched, and the margin of victory becomes closer. 
And that's mostly due to the presence of uh, a third party. The Republicans still carry the state most of the time, but slightly closer margins. Uh, the 1877 election is extraordinary because a third party, the Greenback Party, actually got 15% of the vote, uh, in part because the candidate for governor of the Greenback Party was uh, Edward P. Alice, of, of Alice Chalmers fame. In that case, the Greenback Party took more votes from Democrats, I think, than they did uh, Republicans. Uh, this was uh, during the, the economic downturn following the 1873 panic. And so a lot of people were more concerned about the money supply. Um, the rest of the year's prohibition tended to take more votes, I think perhaps from Republicans. So in 1881, it was a little bit closer. Uh, and again, from 1886 to 1896, but the other political movements, the third party movements, the populists and the socialists, they tended to pull away from democratic columns. So most of the time with these third parties, they draw more from the Democrats than they do from the Republicans. So they give Republicans a little bit more of a leg up. The last of these groups, the third parties, uh, the progressive party is a kind of a special case. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. So altogether, what, you, what we've got is a picture of Republicans really much dominating the state, sometimes with close elections, but a pretty firm grip on state government um, due to those elements of patriotism, ethnocultural voting, and then the presence of third parties. So now we get to the exceptions those times where this normal behavior breaks down. The first of these is in 1873. Uh, the 1873 election is uh, uh, surprising for a couple of reasons. One, it took place in the midst of uh, the beginning of a significant economic downturn. The depression of 1873 was a significant uh, economic depression. It, and it, it worried a lot of people. But in the background, the um, issues that were motivating people were the growing power of uh, corporations, particularly railroads. It's easy to take railroads for granted, but, but it's important to remember how in the 1870s, they really were the lifeblood of, of the economy. They transported goods as well as passengers. They transported the mail. Uh, they, they really were very, very powerful. Farmers were particularly frustrated with the railroads because they were dependent upon the railroads for transporting their uh, produce. Wisconsin in 1873 was a major wheat producer. So these, this wheat had to be transported fairly quickly from where it was grown to where it could be milled, either in Milwaukee or La Crosse or uh, elsewhere. So farmers find themselves being exploited by the railroads on whom they are dependent. Railroads tended to form uh, not exactly monopolies, but they formed uh, very close connections so that they would not compete with one another. So farmers felt very, very much um, aggrieved at their, their treatment by the railroads. So the, the Granger movement, uh, the patrons of husbandry, is a national farm movement that wants to give farmers more economic control over their lives. And it promotes things like, <coughs> like um, uh, cooperatively owned uh, uh, mills, cooperatively owned uh, grain elevators, ways where farmers can store their crops long-term, use that as collateral to get loans. So they're not as dependent on railroads as they have been. The Granger movement is very popular in Wisconsin, and William Taylor, who goes on to be elected governor, is, is one of these Grangers, these Grange leader. He's on the Dane County Board, of uh, county board uh, a very popular figure in, in this farm movement. So this is going to draw in a lot of farm votes that tended to be more Republican, but they're, they're attracted to William Taylor as this, this Granger candidate. The other big issue was the Graham Law. The Graham Law was a liquor control law enacted by the Republican legislature, signed by Governor Washburn. Essentially, it 
required a large cash bond for liquor sellers. So if you were going to open a tavern or if you were uh, owned a, any kind of establishment that served alcohol, you had to put up a cash bond. And anything that happened in terms of criminal activity or uh, um, civil disturbance that resulted on your premises, you were legally liable for. It was a really tough law that was designed to curb drinking and curb the sale of alcohol. Now, if we think back to the ethnocultural model that I talked about a few moments ago, that's going to be popular with some constituents. Yankee reformers and Scandinavians would be sympathetic to the Graham Law. German Protestants, who normally voted Republicans, didn't like that law. And they were angered that the Republican Party would take the German Protestant vote so for granted that they would pass something that obnoxious. So the Protestant German vote that tends to vote Republican voted Democratic. So from, from the Republican perspective, 1873 is a, is a perfect storm. It's an economic depression, which is bad for incumbents of, of any party. Farm movement is challenging the control of the, the domination of the railroads. And then you've got this uh, really nonsensical liquor control measure that alienates one of your key constituents. So as a result of this, uh, the Democrats sweep into office, uh, Taylor becomes governor, and he follows through on his promises. The, the, um, uh, he signs a very strict railroad regulation bill that created a railroad commission that could set rates and control the, the, the railroad industry so that it would be more responsive to its customers. Um, it's a temporary Democratic victory. Um, in 1875, the Republicans nominated Republican businessman uh, from Milwaukee, Harrison Ludington, and very easily defeats Taylor in 1875. And immediately the Republicans repeal everything that Taylor did. So, so Taylor's a very brief Democratic blip in an otherwise Republican uh, period of time. It demonstrates, I think, though, how, how potent those ethnocultural issues can be in terms of motivating voters. Um, if, if you're going to vote for one governor who signed something that you didn't like, you may vote for the other candidate. Similar things happened in 1890. <laughs> the governor in 1890 was uh, very popular, also farmer related. That's William Dempster Horde, pictured here on the left. Uh, he was famous and well-known, uh, very popular among um, agricultural communities in rural areas for his newspaper, Horde's Dairyman, which is still in publication, still based in Fort Atkinson. He was a popular governor, but he had signed an unpopular law, and that was the Bennett Law. The Bennett Law was a compulsory education law. It required Wisconsin children to attend school for 12 weeks out of the year. And it mandated that a school qualified as a school if it offered classes in, in reading, writing, arithmetic, American history. But the kicker was that it had to teach those subjects in the English language. Hoard signed the law. He didn't see any problem with it. He, he thought it was a good thing, right? We, we want our children to be educated. We want to have good schools. It's important to learn English. So he, he didn't see the problem. Well, the problem was that Wisconsin then, as it does now, had a very active uh, parochial school program, particularly among Germans and Norwegians. Norwegian Lutherans operated their own school system, and it was often taught in Norwegian. They did not like the idea that they would no longer be able to send their children to parochial school. They would have to send them to public schools. German Protestants were likewise defended, that they wanted to be able to teach their children in German in their own communities. And even though German Protestants normally would be Republican voters, they could not bring themselves to vote for Horde after signing that law, and instead they vote for the Democratic nominee pictured here on the right, George Peck, the mayor of Milwaukee. 
Norwegians, um, and to a lesser extent, other Scandinavian groups are, are an interesting case here. They didn't switch to George Peck. They simply didn't vote. So turnout is always very, very important. So in this case, the German Protestants were mobilized to turn out in large numbers to vote against Horn. The Norwegians, Swedes, um, and other Scandinavian groups were not motivated to vote at all. They couldn't bring themselves to vote for Horn. They weren't going to vote for Democrats. So they simply didn't vote. Turnout is important. Peck uh, serves a term as governor. He's also extraordinary in that he actually was reelected in uh, 1892. He is the only Democrat to win re-election in a statewide contest between 1855 and 1962. So Democratic victories are few and far between. Peck is the one that actually does it twice. Uh, he was a pretty popular governor. He, he wrote a very humorous um, newspaper called Peck's Bad Boy that was, I suppose, sort of like the mad magazine uh, of the 1880s. So with both of these the elections, 1873 and 1890, we see that the normal pattern is disrupted by these, uh, these events that, that really, uh, I think, are, are come down to those ethnic and cultural differences. Moving into the 20th century, the, other, the next great uh, democratic surprise was in 1930. Uh, 1932. So this we need some background. Um, because the Republican Party was so dominant for so long, it tended to be somewhat factional. And beginning in the 1890s, the faction of the Republican Party that, that was reformist, that wanted to change um, favorite economic reform and, and increased measures for uh, democratic government rallied behind Robert La Follette. So Robert La Follette and the progressives were a faction within the Republican Party. The non-progressives were known as stalwarts, uh, steadfast or loyal Republicans. So the big contest, because of this period of Republican dom denom uh, domination, was usually the Republican primary. The primary elections go into effect in 1906, and um, the La Follette faction promoted a candidate, the Stalwart faction promoted a candidate, and generally whichever faction secured the nomination, that candidate went on to defeat the Democrat. That was the case for uh, 32 years, basically. So in 1930, that um, progressive faction nominated Philip La Follette. Philip La Follette was uh, Fighting Bob's younger son. He sees the Great Depression as um, a major crisis in American democracy, and he wants to do something about it. He is running against Walter Kohler. Um, Walter Kohler had the best name recognition of any political candidate anywhere ever. Hundreds of thousands of Wisconsin residents saw his name every morning when they used the bathroom. This is the Kohler of Kohler Plumbing. He was in the incumbent government. He had been elected in 1928. And in the Republican primary election of 1930, Philip La Follette defeated him. Goes on to an easy victory uh, over the Democratic nominee. So Philip La Follette, um, is an extraordinary figure, takes the Great Depression very seriously, and uh, he has the, le the legislature passes and he signs uh, some significant measures, uh, uh, an $8 million emergency relief bill to aid with the unemployed, um, uh, a major construction program that eliminated railroad and highway crossings, putting to work hundreds of uh, unemployed men building underpasses and overpasses on these construction jobs. Um, he also signed the first unemployment compensation law in the nation, unemployment insurance, that not only provided a few weeks of assistance to people who had lost their jobs, it actually reduced 
unemployment by encouraging uh, companies by giving them a financial incentive not to lay people off. If they, if they had full employment, they didn't need to pay into the unemployment fund. The moment they start laying people off, they have to start paying into the unemployment fund, so they might as well keep them employed. Uh, as the first in the nation, a landmark piece of legislation. So in two years, Philip LaFollette, who is um, uh, very young, he's, um, in his, uh, he's, he's 35 in 1932, so he's a very young governor, very dynamic, very energetic, has a, a phenomenal first term. One of the people in the United States who is paying very close attention to Philip LaFollette is the governor of New York, Franklin Roosevelt. He kept tabs on what Phil was doing, and when Franklin Roosevelt announces his candidacy, promising a new deal to the American people, a lot of his ideas came from the LaFollettes of Wisconsin, Phil particularly. But what that meant is that there was now a national democratic figure that was speaking the progressive language. And so um, in the Republican primary of 1932, Phil LaFollette, who is now the incumbent, loses his bid for renomination. And you can see that not only did Kohler uh, increase his margin significantly, Phil's dropped. Um, and he put that down to, and I think correctly, a lot of Democrats who normally would have voted for LaFollette in the primary vote in the Democratic election. You cannot vote, you can't split your tickets in a primary election. So that what's happening is that Franklin Roosevelt, as this national liberal figure, is pulling the progressive vote out of the Republican Party and bringing it into the Democratic Party which means the stalwarts are sort of left dominating the party once again. Kohler wins the Republican nomination, but goes on to lose in 1932 to the Democratic nominee, the mayor of Milwaukee, Albert Schmiedemann, uh, by a significant margin, 40, 52 to 42%. So three Democratic victories are all unusual, 1873, 1890, and 1930. For Philip Follett, this poses a long-term problem. The progressive faction had very successfully maintained itself in the Republican Party, but that was no longer possible. They couldn't count on those voters to be loyal, now sort of lured out of the party by um, Franklin Roosevelt. So they move on to the, to the next option. In 1934, Phil and his older brother, Bob, Robert Jr., who is the United States Senator, announced that they're forming a new party, the Progressive Party. They're, 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 they're no longer gonna be part of the Republican Party, they're gonna be an independent third party. The LaFollette name is still very powerful in the 1930s, and in 1934, the, the Progressives do extraordinarily well for their first election. Uh, Bob Jr. is reelected to the US Senate as a progressive, Phil is elected governor. Progressives capture seven out of 10 representatives in Congress, 46 members of the assembly and 12 state Senate elections. That's a sweep. They do very, very well. Phil has a very ambitious program that he proposes and um, Franklin Roosevelt is initially very um, willing to support Phil. They don't really trust one another, but they recognize that there's um, good things should come of this relationship. So what Roosevelt tells Phil is that instead of Wisconsin participating in the usual New Deal uh, programs like the, the uh, NRA or the um, AAA or the WPA or all of those alphabet soup programs, Phil could create his own program called the Wisconsin Works Program that would uh, focus on economic development and uh, economic growth. It's a very promising program. It got a lot of uh, attention nationally and Phil lost by three votes in the Senate. So his, his vision of, of Wisconsin being a trendsetter and, and doing something new and unusual fails by a very small margin. He's determined to try again. So in 1936, Phil is reelected and this time there are progressive majorities in the Assembly and the Senate. But by this time, Franklin Roosevelt is no longer interested in experimentation. 
Roosevelt was reelected, and when he takes office in 1937, uh, if you know anything about U.S. history, this is familiar. Franklin Roosevelt becomes much more concerned about balanced budgets, and so the Works Progress Administration is uh, is reduced. Um, the uh, other New Deal programs are cut back. There's a sort of mini recession within the Great Depression, the so-called Roosevelt recession in 1937. Um, which is a, a major economic slowdown. So he doesn't give Phil the, the blank check that he offered in 1934. 1934, uh, he's offering him $100 million to do whatever he wants. 36, uh, Phil asks for the same kind of arrangement and Franklin Roosevelt turns him down. So once again, the Wisconsin progressives are kind of stuck. They are doing very well in state elections. They control state government. They're nominating the congressional delegation, but they're stuck nationally. So Phil decides to make um, a rather ill-considered, rather foolish decision to try and launch a national third party. In 1938, he has uh, a major rally at the UW Stock Pavilion on a big stage, flags, and uh, the National Guard are there, and the UW marching band is playing tunes. And Phil takes center stage to give a rousing speech calling for a new political party. And as this picture suggests, in 1938, this does not look good. That symbol in the background is supposed to represent a democracy. It's, it's an X in the ballot box. Um, we all know what it looks like. And suddenly newspapers around the country were wondering, what is Phil doing? Is he secretly a Nazi? Is, is he a fascist? What is this? And it completely bombs. The National Progressives of America fails. It, it goes absolutely nowhere. And Phil loses his bid for re-election uh, to boot. The progressives are essentially swooped out of office and the Republicans become again the dominant party. So that brief aberration in the mid-30s, from 34 to 38, is when the progressives kind of steal the, the Republican thunder. I'm always just startled when I see this picture. I've seen this picture hundreds of times, but the bad fortune of Phil to be photographed behind that platform and that symbol in the background with his hand raised like that, oh, as they say, it's bad optics. The long-term effect of uh, Roosevelt's um, change in the Democratic Party uh, doesn't really hit until the 1940s. <coughs> um, the Republican Party continues to dominate elections. Um, and in 1946, Phil is back from the war where he had served on, on General MacArthur's staff. And reluctantly, the La Follettes decide to abandon the Progressive Party. It's, they don't see a future for it. Bob Jr. announces that he is going to run for re-election to a United States Senator uh, as a Republican again. He's going back to the Republican Party. Phil is really um, heartbroken by that decision. and He never runs for office again. He's, he's kind of done with politics. Uh, the tragedy, of course, of that is by running in the Democrat in the Republican uh, primary election, uh, young Bob loses to Joe McCarthy, who is elected senator in 1946, and of course becomes infamous for his his reckless McCarthyism, the, the, this crusade against uh, communism. Where we see the progressive element really uh, enduring is not in the Republican Party, which is where. Bob Jr. wanted it to go. But it's the Democratic Party. This is um, the moment where we get to the, the so-called Young Turks. These were young men, uh, often connected to the UW. Some of them had been part of Philip La Follette's uh, party. I think Carl Thompson was actually his chauffeur for a time. But they decide that nationally, the, the political situation is a conservative Republican Party and a liberal Democratic Party. So they think of themselves as Roosevelt, Truman, Democrats. 
and they want the state party to, to look like that too. So the, the Young Turks really work on rebuilding the Wisconsin Democratic Party, uh, where it, it really languished for years, into a, a liberal party, much like it is today. They're uh, supported to a large degree by the Milwaukee sewer socialists, the, the people like Dan Hone, who becomes a major figure in the Democratic Party. The sewer socialists uh, weren't terribly socialist. They, they wanted efficient, honest government. They wanted to end corruption and they wanted um, good municipal services. So they're sewer socialists. But Dan Hone and brings that element to the party. So the, the, the Democratic Party emerges as a new, uh, new organization that draws its strength from uh, farm organizations. They, they, they canvass all over the state and, and gain significant support in rural areas. Labor unions become solidly democratic. Uh, and the two big cities in Wisconsin, Madison and Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee is, is very much the working class blue collar union vote. Madison is the, the so-called Madison intelligentsia. They are the ones that really um, transform uh, the, um, the Democratic Party into essentially what it is today. The big breakthroughs come in 1957 with the election of Bill Proxmire. More than anyone else, Bill Proxmire, pictured here, is the one that brings farmers into the Democratic Party. He is absolutely tireless in traveling around the state, talking to farmers, visiting small towns, and, and convincing Democrats, uh, the Democratic Party that they need to have a solid farm program. They need to be able to talk about uh, what's good for, for Wisconsin farmers. He is a very vocal critic of uh, the Secretary of Agriculture who is reducing farm supports. So it, that works really well. So with Proxmire bringing in the farm vote, the labor vote behind him in Milwaukee, he is elected U.S. Senator in 1957. McCarthy had just died. This was a special election. Uh, Proxmire is elected in 57. And then um, re-elected in 58. Also in 1958, um, Gaylord Nelson, who had been one of the, the key figures in rebuilding the Democratic Party, is elected governor, the first governor in uh, since 1932. Uh, and pretty soon he serves two terms and then he is elected U.S. Senator. John Reynolds is elected governor in his place. So we're seeing a, a true two-party system where the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are pretty evenly matched. They have a very clear ideological base. One is a conservative party, one is a liberal party. Wisconsin looks a lot more like the rest of the country at this point uh, as a result of this change. So Wisconsin political history is extraordinarily colorful, exciting, lots of great stories. But we need to talk about uh, what's going on uh, today, because a lot of, of what is current events, I think we can draw from this uh, realignment that occurred in the 40s and 50s. So if you if you paid attention to Wisconsin elections, this is going to look really familiar. Generally speaking, the Republican Party's strength is in suburban Milwaukee, these heavily populated suburbs around uh, the big city. That's where they get a majority of their votes, uh, especially in the Wow counties, Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington. They also do very well in small towns and in rural areas. The Democrats had worked very, very hard, but since Proxmire retired, increasingly rural small town areas are, are, are becoming much, much more Republican. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that that involve um, um, value issues, um, but a lot of it, I think, also is due to the Democrats not really focusing on agricultural issues uh, the way they used to. The Democratic Party, uh, again, as you probably are familiar with, draws its major source of votes from Milwaukee County and Dane County. That's where most of their votes came from. To a lesser extent, uh, some smaller cities, I'm thinking of La Crosse, Kenosha, Eau Claire tend to become increasingly Democratic. Uh, 
The other phenomenon that I'm interested in, that I, that I want to do more, more research in, are, are what I call the Madison exurbs. If you're familiar with um, Madison and Dane County, there is a phenomenal amount of, of sprawl, particularly to the west. And so a lot of these little towns in uh, Western Dane County, Iowa County, Sauk County, uh, had been Republican and increasingly they're very democratic. And I think that's, they're being drawn into Madison orbit. This is where people are moving because Madison, uh, I can tell you is a very expensive place to live. So people are living in these, these exurbs and commuting in. So I think that's shifting that demographic significantly. So this is what, what the, the Republican strategies do. The, the, there it's, and it comes down to turnout. If Democrats can turn out enormous numbers in Milwaukee and Dane County, they win. If they can't do that, then the Republicans have a pretty secure base. In looking at uh, recent elections, um, if I was pulling some numbers together, uh, one of the things that really struck me <coughs> is how remarkably stable it is. Uh, I, I've gone back to, to, to 2000. So I've got the, um, the Democrats in blue, the Republicans in red, and I've underlined the ones that win Wisconsin, not necessarily win the, the state there. But these are presidential elections and uh, gubernatorial elections. And if you look at the numbers um, in 2000, 2002, 2004, it's pretty consistent that Democrats are just squeaking out a very, very close victory. Uh, if you look at the two presidential elections in 2000 and 2004, um, the difference is 0.2% in 2000 and 0.4% in 2004. Um, the 2002 governor's election is unusual in that it was a three-way election in that uh, Jim Doyle was the Democratic nominee, Scott McCallum was the incumbent governor, and then Ed Thompson, if you recall, Ed Thompson, uh, Tommy Thompson's brother, uh, who owned a supper club in uh, Toma, I think, ran as the Libertarian candidate and got 10% of the vote. I th think those Thompson voters probably would have voted for McCallum uh, had there not been a Libertarian alternative. So, uh, I think that probably would have been a Republican victory otherwise. Um, but the, the numbers are, are, are pretty, pretty close. Uh, 2006, Jim Doyle is running for reelection as the incumbent. 2006, recall, was uh, a backlash election. That was the year that the Democrats retook the House of Representatives and retook the Senate uh, nationally. Uh, it was a repudiation, I think, to some degree of, of George Bush's administration. So, so Jim Doyle benefited significantly from that. Uh, particularly if you look at the, the next one, uh, if you look at, at, at the Obama election, which again, I think is a continuation of that repudiation, Obama wins 56.3% of Wisconsin's vote, uh, which is extraordinary. It was, it was a, an exciting election, but that was, um, he did very well statewide, but that was the, the year that he actually carried Indiana as well. But there seems to be sort of a, a, a zeitgeist in the air where they were, were eager for, for something new and something uh, much more optimistic. If you look back at uh, Obama's 2012 victory, 52.8% is almost essentially what Jim Doyle did in 2006. So it's a very, very close match to that. Looking at the governor's elections then, um, in 2010 was a, a kind of a backlash election against Obama. We see Walker winning with 52.3% of the vote. But what I am so struck by in looking at these numbers, look at the, the 2010 and 2014 election for governor. It's almost identical. This is the, the equilibrium. This is sort of the norm for Wisconsin's uh, gubernatorial elections. The big difference that allowed Obama uh, and Jim Doyle to win, I think, was, was turnout. In these cases, there was a massive turnout, particularly in Dane and Milwaukee County, that, that catapults the Democrats uh, to victory. Where we don't have that massive turnout uh, is what we see in uh, 2010 and 2014. 
uh, that just isn't that kind of um, uh, ability to get the Democrats over the edge. More recently, uh, I was particularly impressed, and I have not looked at the final uh, official returns yet. I'm looking at preliminary returns, but what I was, what I found most surprising about the 2020 election was fundamentally how unsurprising it was. It, it looked very much like every other uh, presidential election since 2000. Um, there were very decidedly Democratic states. There were very decidedly Republican states. And it was basically the same number of toss-ups and they just fell a little bit differently in 2020 than they did in 2016. If you'll notice, um, in 2016, Donald Trump got 47.2% of the vote. He did better in 2020 in both absolute numbers and a percentage of numbers. So what that, that suggests to me is that that's sort of the more equilibrium. Trump's total looks pretty similar to um, Scott Walker's election, uh, loss in uh, 2018. The numbers are, are quite similar. And look at Evers and Biden in 2018 and 2020. This is what a big turnout election can look like, but it is close. Uh, they just squeaked in over the top. I think uh, Joe Biden, the last I saw, um, uh, was had um, uh, was leading by twenty thousand votes in Wisconsin. So what where are we at now? Uh, in contrast to that long period of Republican domination that um, I, I discussed earlier, we have a very stable and very close two party system. There's some pretty clear ideological differences, and what it really turns out uh, boils down to, I think, is turnout especially in Milwaukee County. In those elections where there is a large turnout uh, in any statewide race, I've, I've just charted the presidential and governor's races, but Supreme Court races, uh, Senate races, if there's a huge turnout, the Democrats are able to edge out the Republicans. If turnout is down, the Republicans have a significant advantage. The only really interesting, as I said, I haven't looked at, at, at um, the final data yet, because it's not yet out. But in 2020, the one change that I did notice are those Milwaukee suburbs, the Washington, Ozaukee, and Waukesha counties, shifted a bit Democratic. They didn't flip. They are still by Republican by a large margin, but the margin was decreased by uh, about, it looked like about 10 or 12 percentage points. That's enough to turn on an election. So I think a lot of those um, suburbs, and this is one of the things that was uh, being talked about nationally, they did in fact find Biden the, the more attractive candidate. So where are we gonna go from here? I, I, well, I don't predict the future, I just took the past. But it looks to me like we are going to be in this very stable two-party system for quite a while. Um, and sadly, that means that when every election comes around, we are again, again going to be inundated by those robocalls and bombarded by political ads because it all comes down to turnout with this kind of um, system. Well, thank you all for um, uh, joining me tonight. This was a fun topic to talk about. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it, uh, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions, if uh, there are any. We did have a couple questions. Um, there was a question earlier about, um, do you have books to learn more about past elections or politicians um, like McCarthy? And I know uh, in the intro, I did mention that you're an author of several books, but I didn't mention um, what the topics are. So if you wanted to sure. tell us a little bit about your books, and then if you had any other recommendations um, for learning more. Sure. Uh, well, the, the, the two books that, um, that I've got out that, that are relevant, uh, one is a biography of Philip LaFollette. You may have noticed that I got kind of excited talking about Philip LaFollette because he's an interesting guy. But um, uh, I have a biography about him called Fighting Son, uh, which came out in 2006. And uh, just recently, I've uh, published a biography of Bill Proxmire. 
that came out about two years ago um, called uh, Proxmire Bulldog of the Senate. So those are both by the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society Press. I'm sure they would be happy to know that I am plugging the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. Uh, will be good. Uh, another one that I like that is about Wisconsin politics generally uh, is called Wisconsin Votes, which I just happen to have here. Um, it's by uh, Robert Booth Fowler, and it, it talks a lot about um, uh, why people vote the way they do and the, the ethno-cultural model that explains uh, Wisconsin's voting behavior. So I'd recommend that one. Um, uh, there's, there's lots on Wisconsin politics. It, it's such a rich topic. I know um, there was one recently, I think that came out earlier this year or last year about um, McCarthy called Demagogue um, by Larry Ty. And we were hoping to have him um, this fall, but with scheduling conflicts, it didn't work out, but um, definitely look forward to that program in the future. Yes, uh, it, that's a, that's a, that'd be a good book. Uh, McCarthy really continues to be a polarizing figure in Wisconsin, surprisingly. And of course, um, being the Appleton Library, a lot of people, you know, are looking for are. more information on him because he's from Appleton. He is. He, he was a judge in uh, out of Gamey County. And then um, there was a question about why such a big turnout of voters in some years and not in others? That's a, a good question. <laughs> Generally speaking, in Wisconsin, there is much greater turnout in presidential years. That's always been the case, um, simply because the, the races get so much more attention. There are national issues involved, so there are national political ads. There's national uh, get out the vote efforts, so, so that boosts it. Where we see big turnout, I think the big turnout in um, um, 2006, was uh, a, a, what I called a backlash election, where there were so many people who were just so frustrated with the current political situation, frustrated with George Bush um, and the Iraq war, that, that they just wanted something different. They, they, in six years of Republican, they wanted something different. Uh, I think the same thing could be said with uh, Tony Evers' victory over Walker. The, there was a large turnout, again, particularly in Milwaukee and Madison. Uh, Evers and uh, Mandela Barnes ran a really smart campaign, and they really used social media in a, a very, very good way. And I, I, think, I think that really was, was uh, what worked for them. Is they, there was kind of a reaction against Walker, as, as tends to happen. Um, but they really inspired turnout by, by some of their rather quirky um, social media campaign. The, the social media is, is really, I think, we're just starting to figure out how important that is. Uh, it's been around for a while, but, but sometimes we're a little slow on perceiving all of the uh, consequences. Yeah, and I think each election, it definitely gets bigger and bigger. It is, and, and, and this last uh, election, uh, the turnout was absolutely astonishing, uh, the, the numbers, um, and the, um, the numbers of people voting early was, was really remarkable for obvious reasons. I mean, and, and certainly it made sense to vote by mail, um, but the, just, just the, the sheer number of votes is, is just mind-blowing. This is with the largest presidential turnout, I think, since 1904, uh, which is remarkable. Well, those were all the questions we had, right. unless anybody else had any other last minute questions. Um, thank you again so much for your time and your expertise. It was a wonderful presentation. I know I certainly learned a lot that I didn't know. It was fun, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And there's just a comment, uh, great presentation. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, everyone have a good night and Thank you everyone for attending and be sure to look for the recording on our YouTube channel um, tomorrow. Thank you everyone. Good night. Good night.